Okay, well, welcome everyone to the Elias Andrews Lecture in Science and Religion at the Queen's School of Religion. And although you know, we wish we could conduct this event together in person and bring us all together, at least using um, this virtual platform does allow those outside of Kingston area to attend and participate. And so we welcome you all wherever you are. Wherever we are in Canada or in North America, however, we are on Indigenous land. So before beginning, I want to recognize that as I speak to you now from Theological Hall on the campus of Queen's University in Kingston, that the university is situated on traditional Ashinaabe and Haudenosaunee territory. And I'm grateful to be able to live, albeit as an uninvited guest, upon the traditional territories of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Ashinaabe Nation. To acknowledge this traditional territory is, of course, to recognize that it has a much longer history predating the establishment of the earliest European colonies. It is also to acknowledge this territory's significance for the indigenous peoples who lived and continue to live upon it and whose practices and spiritualities were tied to the land and continue to develop in relationship to the territory and its other inhabitants today. The School of Religion is also grateful to the generosity of many benefactors and in particular to the Reverend Dr. Elias Andrews in whose name this lecture, this lectureship has been endowed. Uh, Dr. Andrews who passed away in 1992 was born in Winterton, Newfoundland in 1906. He entered Methodist College in St. John's in 1922 received a teaching certificate in 1924, served as an upper school teacher for a couple of years before joining the Ministry of the United Church in 1927 in Newfoundland. 1929, he attended Pine Hill Divinity College in Halifax until 1935, graduating uh, in theology, and in 1938 became professor of philosophy and psychology of religion at Pine Hill. In 1948, he moved uh, west and served as director of the School of Lay Studies at Emmanuel College uh, in Toronto before joining Queen's Theological College in 1955 as its principal. And he was the author of several works, uh, Modern Humanism and Christian Theism, The Meaning of Christ for Paul and Apostle of Grace. He guided the college for 15 years from 1955 to 1970, during a time of great cultural, social, and political change during the 1960s, and also of major challenges to this institution. He retired in 1974, and so we're very pleased to remember his legacy and outstanding service to the school as we look forward to tonight's lecture. So in light of that, I'd like to ask um, our colleague, Dr. Tracy Trothan, to introduce our lecturer and chair the session this evening Dr. Trothan is professor of ethics in both the School of Religion and the School of Rehabilitation Therapy. She's the author and editor of numerous books, including most recently, just this year with Calvin Mercer, a book entitled Religion and the Technological Future, an Introduction to Biohacking, AI and Transhumanism. Dr. Trothan, thank you for chairing the session tonight. Thank you very much. Appreciate that kind introduction. Um, I am delighted to be here with you all, and it is a, a pleasure to see so many familiar names of participants who have joined us so far. I'm looking forward to uh, spending this part of this evening with you very much. And it's my pleasure and honor to introduce to you the Reverend Dr. Ron Cole Turner, who agreed uh, very graciously to, um, to serve in this capacity and present the lectureship uh, this evening. Dr. Ron Cole Turner is retiring later this month from the faculty at Pittsburgh Theological Seminary, where he held the H. Parker Sharp Professor of Theology and Ethics, a position relating theology and ethics to developments in science and technology for 25 years. He is an ordained minister of the United Church of Christ, a founding member of the International Society for Science and Religion, 
and he currently serves on the executive committee of that society and has served until 2019 as co-chair of the American Academy of Religion Unit on Human Enhancement in Transhumanism. He has also served on the advisory boards of the John Templeton Foundation and the Metanexis Institute and testified for the US National Bioethics Advisory Commission on ethical issues in stem cell research. Professor Cole Turner also has mentored many of us throughout our academic journeys, empowering many scholars in the area of science and religion. He has actively worked to encourage faculty to research and to teach about the intersection of science and religion. His most recent books include a study of human evolution and its theological significance entitled The End of Adam and Eve, Theology and the Science of Human Origins. Other books that he has uh, written or um, edited include the Christian Perspectives on Transhumanism and the Church, Chips in the Brain, Immortality, and the World of Tomorrow. And other books are Transhumanism and Transcendence, Christian Hope in an Age of Technological Enhancement, The New Genesis, Theology and the Genetic Revolution, Pastoral Genetics, Theology and Care at the Beginning of Life, for which he won a prestigious award, Human Cloning, Religious Responses, Beyond Cloning, Religion and the Remaking of Humanity, God in the Embryo, Religious Voices on Stem Cells and Cloning, and Design and Destiny, Jewish and Christian Perspectives on Human Germline Modification. He is also the author of the popular baptismal hymn, Child of Blessing, Child of Promise. He is currently working on a theological interpretation of religious experience in light of recent uh, work on science and technology, building on his published groundbreaking work on psychedelics and spirituality. I am very privileged to welcome Dr. Ron Coulterner to deliver our biannual Elias Andrews Public Lecture in Theology and Science. Thank you so much, uh, Tracy, for that gracious introduction. And I'm really delighted to accept the invitation and to uh, spend this time with uh, all of you this afternoon. Thank you for everyone who has joined this event. And um, I look forward to engaging with you as we go through the next hour or so. Uh, thank you, uh, Adnan, for uh, uh, getting the afternoon launched here. And a reminder of the distinguished career of Elias Andrews. I hope that this lecture um, does uh, something to add to um, his stature and uh, recognition as an outstanding leader in the history of your institution. So I, I have a lot that I wanna cover, so I'm gonna jump right in. And let me start with this question. What do you suppose is happening in the human brain when someone is having a religious or mystical experience? Well, we could try to capture that moment in a uh, brain imaging device, MRI kind of device. The trouble is if uh, most people are like me, we don't go around having spiritual or mystical experiences very often. And in fact, the chances of catching me having one while I'm in an fMRI machine is, uh, well, I mean, that's just not going to happen. Which takes us to the year 2006. There was a report published that year that just kind of threw me back in my chair, and I, I still don't know quite what to make of it. In that year, a team of researchers at Johns Hopkins University published the result that using psilocybin extracted from mushrooms, call them magic mushrooms if you like, call them sacred mushrooms, psilocybin extracted from mushrooms at a dose in the 20 to 30 milligram range could reliably occasion, they used the word occasion, they didn't want to use the word cause, right? Reliably occasion a mystical experience. In fact, 
a staggering two thirds of the people involved in that fairly small but groundbreaking study reported that the experience they had while the psilocybin was being metabolized in their system was among the most profoundly meaningful of their whole lifetime. It was the most important uh, event uh, that, um, it, it was one of the most important events that they had ever uh, experienced. They used phrases like um, being in the presence of a loving transcendent reality or it felt more real to me at that moment than talking to you does right now. Uh, it felt just profoundly rewarding, enriching. Uh, again, two thirds of the people responded by saying, uh, yes, I felt something profoundly, richly, meaningfully mystical or spiritual, a sense of connection, a sense of transcending myself but also transcending the, the narrow categories of some of my prior beliefs. Did it transform them? Did it make them into a better person? Well, some of them said, yes, of course, what would you expect? Um, uh, tellingly though, some of their friends, people they lived with or people they lived close to also said, yes, I felt that this person who underwent this experience was transformed and in some ways a better person. Well, to me that has two really, really big implications. And I, again, I'm not sure I've sorted through these yet. Um, that's part of what we're gonna to try to do here this afternoon. First of all, uh, you remember where we started? I asked what's going on when a person's having a mystical experience, but trying to catch it in the lab just ain't gonna happen, right? Well, yes, it can. If you can now use this substance to reliably occasion the mystical experience, then you can predictably go into the lab and put people into these um, um, uh, imaging devices and look, what's the brain doing? Uh, it, it's not quite clear what the brain is doing. Lots of things are going on. Some activities are increased, some activities are diminished. So it's not quite clear what we're seeing, but we're getting a window on the neurological correlates of this intense subjective experience. So it's possible to study mystical experience or spiritual experience in the scientific medical laboratory. Well, that was implication number one that hit me right off the top. But the thing that really got me, that really threw me on my heels was the recognition that as a person who had kind of given my whole life to the development of religious institutions, I could think of nothing in traditional religion that came anywhere close to what this little 20 to 30 milligram pill could offer. No religious ritual, practice, service, event on the planet in any tradition has the kind of result of being able to say two thirds of the people who underwent that with us experienced something profound. I mean, it, it's a joke in some of our churches, of course. Does anybody feel anything? Does anybody um, uh, feel any moment of intensity or religious um, uh, fervor or uh, religious um, uh, in, 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 intensely deep, meaningful experience? I mean, people walk out of churches or other houses of worship, uh, certainly for Christian churches, they walk out and say, oh, that was a profoundly meaningful sermon, pastor, but we know they don't really mean that it was meaningful in any top five kind of sense, which is exactly what they meant in the 2006 experiment. They were rating the experience they underwent with this little psilocybin pill among the top five, for some of them, the, the very top experience of a lifetime. What do we have in religion that comes close? And it just hit me, we've got nothing. 
We have nothing that comes close to that. Well, but hold on a minute. So is, is religion primarily to be thought of as religious experience? I mean, isn't there more to religion than just intense experience? And of course, the answer is yes. Um, someone once quipped, uh, well, these drugs might cause religious experience. Do they cause religious lives? Do they help people become more deeply and profoundly religious in the best sense of that word? Uh, more attached to a community, more committed to social justice, more uh, engaged in uh, the practices and uh, uh, traditions of one's, uh, 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 of one's family and extended community. And on that, well, I'm, I'm really trying to sort this out in my own head. And I guess I would say that these intense experiences by any pathway of cause, these intense experiences have a little bit of yes and a little bit of no when it comes to religious, uh, re religious dimensions. After all, what is religion if not something that grows in the life of an individual as the result, uh, as an outflow of some moment somewhere along the line of meaningful and intense experience? If there's never any kind of experiential connector, um, religion grows stale and people do wander away. Uh, pretty obvious that, that's, uh, that, that that happens. So to what extent is a religious experience that, that does it serve as that transformative event that brings a person deeper and deeper into the, um, uh, into the totality of religion? It's not in itself the totality of religion, but it is the leading event that brings one in and gives one the staying power to see what else is at stake here in the discipline, the daily rituals, the practices of a religious life within a community uh, exemplified by good works for uh, those around us. So yes, but at the same time, I'm thinking that maybe um, people who undergo these experiences will kind of say to themselves, well, do I really need religion anymore? And let's suppose for just a moment that they, uh, the religion that they've run into up to this point has not been exactly helpful. In fact, it might be hurtful. And we all know uh, all the ways in which religion institutionalized has hurt people, either with dogmas that it's forced them to believe on peril of losing their eternal life, or worse than that, in uh, um, covering up and condoning uh, abusive practices that um, marginalize, dismiss, and outright uh, just violate the basic human dignity of other, other persons. Uh, religion means a lot of things. And it, in its institutional uh, dogmatic uh, manifestations, some of the things it means is just not that pretty. So, Will there be people who say, well, I used to believe that dogma, but now once I have kind of seen for myself as a result of this experience, what a loving presence is all about, I'm not gonna kind of subscribe to these creeds and doctrines and dogmas. And I am certainly not gonna believe anymore that my eternal uh, joy is at stake if I have trouble believing these things. So I'm not sure what the upshot will be, but I remember it, shortly after 2006, when I read that story, well, this is the kind of stuff that went through my mind very quickly. But then, of course, I caught myself, uh, whoa, 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 what's, what's going on here? This psychedelics, really? Um, how can we be talking about psychedelics and religion and spirituality and mysticism all in a meaningful paragraph? Uh, everybody knows, at least somebody like me, you know, professor of theology, we're supposed to know that established religion is against psychedelic drugs, right? I mean, I, I, I'm old enough to have been around in the 60s. I, I know some of the stories and the history and the memories of that uh, 
decade. Not my favorite decade, by the way. And by the time we get to the 70s, of course, we have the war on drugs, um, all the more intensified as we go into the 80s. Uh, the war on drugs. I Gosh, I don't know if in Canada you saw the ad, but there was a famous ad that was run on television again and again and again. Um, it uh, began with, a, with a, a frying pan and somebody cracked an egg and the egg dropped into the pan and began to sizzle and uh, the voice came on and said, this is your brain on drugs. Any questions? Well, the question we should have been asking is, why is the government lying to us? Now, some drugs, uh, cocaine, um, fentanyl, yeah, yeah those, those are real problems. And please don't confuse anything I'm saying here today uh, to, uh, as cutting any slack for our concern to um, uh, control and tamp down addiction to these drugs. Uh, huge problem. But not all drugs fit within the same category, even though they were all targeted equally by the war on drugs. The simple truth is these psychedelic drugs that we're gonna be talking about here today, notably psilocybin and uh, LSD, uh, DMT, which is drawn from that funny toad that lives out in the desert, and to some extent, a little different kind of category, um, MDMA, commonly known as ecstasy. Um, these drugs, well, to, to, to be targeted by the war on drugs, they're supposed to meet two criteria. One is highly addictive and no medical benefit. Both of those are lies. Uh, why does the, well, I know somebody's, somebody's already ahead of me. Why does the government lie to us? Well, somebody's thinking, well, that's the government. That's what the government does. I mean, I, I believe we were making progress in Vietnam. I believe we were making progress in Afghanistan. And so I believed in the war on drugs. And a lot of people do. Uh, that's just the nature of uh, this kind of propaganda. But so one thing we learned from the 1960s was that uh, the government can be a little bit aggressive in uh, condemning things without proper evidence. Uh, we also learned that there was a huge market in uh, across North America for so-called recreational use of these drugs. That's a little bit problematic because um, bad trips, yeah, they do happen. Uh, people do experience um, emotional intensities that are beyond their capacity to deal with at the moment. Um, so recreational use is not something that uh, anybody wants to advocate here. Um, we also learned that uh, for coming out of the 1960s that somehow, I mean, did the, did the psychedelics cause the counterculture or did the counterculture cause the interest in psychedelics? Uh, who knows? But we also we learned that there was a growing counterculture of people who were not in favor of the, uh, um, the U.S. war in Vietnam, not in favor of this, that, and the other, um, in favor, in other words, of a more peaceful and just society, uh, and hopeful that there would be a cultural transformation that occurred. Well, that wasn't what happened. Uh, was it? Is the hope of a of a cultural transformation still only a pipe dream? Uh, well, it certainly was in the 1960s. For a few people in the 1960s, uh, these drugs led to a bona fide spiritual discovery. And for some of them, they never let go of the significance of those moments in which they were uh, deep into the awareness of a transcendent and loving reality that seemed uh, to almost merge with them and become so powerfully transformative. Again, they never let that go. And for a very few, there was an awareness that these drugs may have profound mental health benefits. Some of the studies in the 60s hinted at that. The methodology is not up to our standards today. But some of the people that pursued that angle were deeply convinced some of these drugs may offer a pathway to mental health. And that, my friends, is exactly what has driven 
what is now being called the psychedelic renaissance. It's not exactly my favorite term, but you, you kind of know what it's pointing at. A renewal of, uh, of, 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 of um, the effort to study these drugs in a much more contemporary, disciplined, sophisticated way. Uh, they're hard to study. Um, the government hurdles um, and other reasons make them hard to study, but there is a, dare we say, a kind of mental health gold rush going on around the world. Um, you're not far from it in Canada. It's all over us here across the U.S. Uh, and, in, uh, and in Europe. Drug companies, um, in some cases private foundations, but mostly private for-profit drug companies pursuing patents leading to uh, possible substances, derivatives and, and uh, modifications of these substances that they believe they will be able to show have medical um, mental health benefits. Now, some of these uh, studies are well along, and so we can assert with a reasonable degree of confidence that yes, these drugs, uh, uh, particularly if we include MDMA at the moment, do have uh, medical benefits. Um, MDMA is well along the pathway of being studied in terms of its relieving of uh, people from PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, particularly our veterans. And my gosh, if you don't know in Canada, this is a huge burden that we bear in the United States as a result of our military adventures in the Persian Gulf and in Afghanistan over the last 20 years now. Um, roughly 20 veterans of those conflicts die every day as a result of suicide. More die, more have died from suicide than from combat. Uh, I mean, it just breaks our hearts uh, across the political spectrum. Uh, nobody wants to see that continue. So um, anything that might help, well, might this drug, MDMA, famous for raves and um, you know, the so-called love drug of the, of the, of the, uh, of, of 25 years ago, might that help? Uh, well, clinical trials are moving along very well on that. So PTSD, but not just that, uh, depression, um, particularly looking at treatment resistant depression, people who um, don't seem to be helped by at least of the uh, two different uh, medical approaches, uh, depression, anxiety, substance addictions, uh, nicotine is one of the most addictive substances on the planet, might um, psilocybin, <laughs> which is on the schedule of addictive substances, right? Um, you see how logical this is, might psilocybin bring release to people who are addicted to nicotine? A pilot study was resoundingly successful and our beloved National Institutes of Health spending American tax dollars has just funded as about a month ago, a major study at Johns Hopkins University to test out the um, uh, benefits of nicotine I'm sorry, benefits of, not much benefit of nicotine, the benefits of psilocybin in releasing people from their compulsion and bondage to nicotine. Obsessive compulsive disorders. Uh, one very interesting category is um, the excessive anxiety that some people feel. I mean, he hearing that we are uh, suffering from a terminal illness, terminal cancer, let's say, is anxiety inducing. There's no way around that. But for some, it is so excessive that they are almost unable to relate to the people around them and whatever uh, 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 medical care can be given to them. Uh, might they be released from some of the excessiveness so that they can go about the work of um, preparing uh, for the end? Um, another category would just be anything that involves excessive rumination, just being held in the vice grip of thoughts that seem to limit or demean or downgrade your sense of self, and you can't shake them, you just go back to them again and again and again, something daddy said to you or mommy said to you or some bully says to you or whatever. Uh, the, the force of rumin, uh, excessive rumination. 
All of these are uh, within the scope of mental health categories. And it's estimated that uh, approximately uh, one out of 20 human beings worldwide suffers from at least one of these uh, 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 category, one, one of these uh, uh, ailments. Beyond strict mental health, there are other um, findings that have come as a result of some of the experimentation here. Uh, it was found based again in John, at Johns Hopkins that um, treatment with psilocybin increased the personality trait of openness. Some of you will know about personality traits and you know that they don't change much. Well, what they discovered was the change in openness as a result of like a six hour drug session, the change in openness was on the scale of the possible entire lifetime change. An increase in the personality trait of openness or cognitive flexibility. Uh, how much of our self-limiting is because we can't manage the cognitive flexibility. We can't look at things the, uh, another way. In fact, <laughs> it occurs to me that I'm pleading with you during this talk to try to look at things the other way. Don't believe the war on drugs stuff. Uh, let's look at it another way, right? Do you have that kind of cognitive flexibility? Some people swear by um, the creativity that comes from these drugs. And in fact, uh, out here on the West Coast, there's quite a subculture of what's called microdosing, small, very small amounts of LSD or psilocybin daily or maybe several times a week, just as a, what, a, a boost to, Creativity, imaginative thinking, which, uh, by the way, out here, uh, in, certain, in certain groups, there, there's a direct path between creativity and net worth. And so uh, anything that you can do to boost the creativity. Well, all of that's been shown as a result of this so-called psychedelic renaissance. And of course, back to our core subject here, spiritual or mystical experience. Part of the challenge, though, here, of course, is how do we define mystical or spiritual experience? And this is a bit controversial uh, as to how we're going to go about defining it. Um, the, the standard tool used at the Johns Hopkins studies and in some of the other studies is a, uh, a scale developed early in the 1960s and then kind of set on the shelf for a while, uh, sometimes called the Panky, that's P-A-H-N-K-E, Panky Richards Mystical Experience Questionnaire. And it uh, derives from the work of William James and then the philosopher W.T. Stace, both of whom studied mysticism. And uh, they, Stace in particular, put forward um, uh, the seven categories that seem to be components of mystical experience. And I'm going to read through a little bit of this, uh, read through the list of the categories, but also read through some of the descriptors. Now, after the experience, the researcher would ask, um, does this uh, score this on a one to five scale? In the experience you've just had, would you agree? Uh, so internal unity is the first category. And the statements would be something like this. Loss of your usual identity. Agree? Strongly agree? Not at all? Loss of your usual identity or experience of unity with ultimate reality. Now, remember, you get all these categories broken down, scored separately, and if the numbers are high enough, then you score the person as having had a mystical experience. So without uh, lo looking at any individual here, just bear in mind, uh, a research subject would have to be saying threes and fours and fives to at least several of these in order to, to qualify, uh, and, and two-thirds did. So loss of your usual identity, experience of unity. Uh, second category, external unity experience of the insight that all is one. Three, transcendence of time and space. Feeling that you have been outside of history, 
in a realm where time does not exist. That's beginning to sound just a little bit spooky. But wait, <laughs> number four, ineffability and paradoxicality. Um, okay. Ineffability, what does that mean? That's an old term in philosophy and in religion. It means that something is indescribable, right? Something cannot be described in words. So ineffability and paradoxicality. So uh, here would be the statements. Sense that the experience cannot be described adequately in words. Agree? Disagree? Feeling that it would be difficult to communicate your own experience to others who have not had similar experiences. Number five, sense of sacredness. Pretty obvious what that means. Sense of profound humility before the majesty of what was felt to be sacred or holy, or sense of awe or awesomeness. Uh, number six, noetic quality. Now, this is kind of my favorite, noetic quality. This goes back all the way to William James. Feeling that the consciousness experienced during part of the session was more real than your normal awareness of everyday reality. People would come out of these sessions and say, well, I don't know what it was, but was it real? Yes, more real than sitting here talking to you. More real than everyday experience. Strange. But it, gave, it gives people such confidence in the meaning of what they have just experienced. I, I know that I know this. I know that I know this with more certainty than I know that I'm sitting and looking at this screen and that kind of thing. So that's number six, noetic quality. Um, seven, deeply felt positive mood. Uh, are you ready for this? Experience of overflowing energy, feelings of tenderness and gentleness, feelings of peace and tranquility, experience of ecstasy, feelings of exaltation, feelings of universal or infinite love, feelings of joy. Again, people would say yes, yes, yes to enough of those things to uh, measure uh, uh, this as um, counting as mystical experience. Now, you listen to that, or I listen to that, or some scientists listen to that, and they say, whoa, 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 what's going on here? Is that science? I mean, since when do we get into all this God kind of language and come on let's clean the mystical out of the out of the lab that doesn't have any place in the scientific um, uh, mindset the scientific laboratory in the university setting um, can science really define and measure these things as phenomena of human experience or uh, to put it more directly can neuroscience look for the neural correlates of these phenomena? Well, that's going to be a debate for a while. And I, it's going to be very interesting because perhaps there are some scientists who are a little bit over aggressive about chasing the mystical out of the lab. I mean, this is what people report. This is what people say they experience. Do we take that at empirical face value? And if we do, what do we make of it in the lab? I don't mean to dismiss the problem entirely, but uh, let's keep an open mind. Uh, it's not simply the drugs that may occasion open-mindedness. I think those engaged in research need to bring a certain open-mindedness to the whole process. But one of the ways in which this all gets uh, focused is on the question of whether something like an intense, meaningful, personal experience that we can call mystical, whether an experience like that is a necessary component of the pathway to the mental health benefit. Now, a lot of evidence is suggesting PTSD or let's go with uh, depression. 
Um, psilocybin, properly administered, properly um, uh, uh, set up in terms of preparatory work and support and all of that, seems to be a very promising pathway to relief of uh, major depression, treatment-resistant depression. The question that is being debated among researchers is like this. Well, no argument that these substances have that benefit. What role does the intensive subjective experience play? Does the subjective intense ex mystical experience play a necessary role or is it possible to kind of keep the whole thing at the molecular level? I mean, gosh, I mean, a lot of people, I mean, when you get to be my age, almost everybody takes some sort of drug. I'll, I'll go home tonight and I'll take my statin and I will think about swallowing it uh, with enough water and then I won't think about it anymore. And it won't cause any intense subjective experience. And yet I remain confident based on medical studies that it's doing me some benefit, right? So I'll take it. And there's no sense whatsoever in anybody's mind, my mind, my doctor's mind, the drug manufacturer's mind, no sense at all that I need to be aware of that drug as it, has, as it, as it a is active in my body. I do not have any subjective awareness of it, 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 it's working its way through me. I also have to take it every day to make sure it's worthwhile. <laughs> Here's where psychedelics are really very different. Once, maybe twice, not daily, once or twice, maybe, maybe, maybe a booster shot later, but once or twice, um, but intense experience. And some would like to say, oh, well, let's just keep it like the statin. You don't have to be thinking about it. You don't have to be aware of it. You don't have to be uh, conscious of it. It will do its work at the, what, at the molecular, the cellular level, maybe at the level of brain networks and um, um, brain systems. Um, after all, um, maybe what it does is stimulates cognitive flexibility. I and mean, we talked about that a little bit earlier. And so let's look for neural flexibility as a neurological neuroscientific correlate of fl uh, cognitive flexibility. And maybe that's how these things work. Um, and these subject and this mystical stuff, that's just epiphenomenal. It doesn't really make anything happen. It happens. But if it didn't happen, no big deal. You still would have the therapy. You still would have the medical benefit. Maybe it works at that level of cognitive and neuro flexibility, or maybe it works at the level of neurogenesis and uh, neuroplasticity. Um, eh, that's possible. It's, it seems to be one of the benefits of the drugs, but is that how it works? Uh, or maybe it just does something in the neural networks to allow the brain to kind of let go uh, of rigidly held prior beliefs. Or as I like to think of it, it, it makes the beliefs let go of the mind, let go of the brain, so that they no longer kind of dominate and keep us in our cognitive ruts of um, misguided ideas that seem to hold us bondage. I mean, there, there probably are more than a few mental illnesses which have as a key component just bad ideas. And cognitive uh, therapy that releases us from these ideas uh, can be beneficial. And maybe these drugs work as a kind of accelerator to cognitive therapy. Well, interesting, let's study the idea. Or some have suggested that maybe these drugs uh, act in particular on a, uh, a network in the brain uh, known specifically as the default mode network, default mode network. And it, to what extent might we think of the default mode network as the neurological what, center of, the, of your self? 
Uh, we're, we're skating on pretty thin ice at this point in, in my view, but the, the idea is out there. It's being put forward in the peer reviewed medical scientific literature. Um, it, 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 does it allow the uh, default mode network to kind of fall more silent and the sense of self to be released, kind of a loss of self-awareness, a loss of egocentric consciousness, a relaxation of the ego boundaries, beginning to sound slightly Zen here, but it also has elements within Christianity and, and other religions. Uh, getting over this preoccupation with a sense of self, uh, is that in some ways therapeutic? And does the drug just simply uh, cause this to happen at the level of neural networks? Um, does, is that how it works or does it trigger relaxation of beliefs? I don't personally find any of these to be convincing. Uh, let's... Um, more research, as we always say, more research is needed. Uh, we might find that, yes, there's a perfectly good molecular, cellular, neurological explanation for the uncanny, likely effectiveness, mental health beneficial effectiveness of these drugs. We might find a clearly elucidated, robust pathway. I'm not sure we will. I put my money on the idea that some sort of intense experience is necessary. But here's where we could get into an interesting kind of debate. Um, it, it, when we use the word mystical, does it have to be religious? Is it possible that the word mystical, the phrase mystical experience is bigger than religion? I mean, some people who follow pathways of religion enter those pathways as a result of mystical experience. I mean, <laughs> Christianity, right? Um, Saul, you remember, has this really intense experience. And there, I mean, he's so changed, he changes his name. He becomes Paul, right? I mean, that, that's right at the core of the founding of Christianity. So it's very hard for anybody with an awareness of the origins of Christianity to say mystical experience is irrelevant to the, the, the source of religion. So mystical experience can lead to religion. It can also lead to a different kind of what, um, I hate to use the word secular, let's just use the word natural, a naturalistic uh, mystical sense a sense of connection with nature. I hope that kind of phrase offends nobody. I felt a profound connection with others, uh, with family, with friends, with acquaintances, with the natural world. These drugs do seem to occasion just that kind of an experience. For some, it is going to have religious dimensions, and it might, in fact, lead to a religious commitment. For others, it might have religious dimensions that debunk prior religious commitments. I'm serious about that. This kind of mystical experience has always served as a um, double-edged sword for traditional religion. And again, I'm speaking primarily of Christianity. Christianity wouldn't exist without it, but constantly you have people undergoing mystical experiences and saying, okay, you theologians, you think you understand this, you think you've got it figured out, you think you've got this, you've got a, you've got a monopoly here on spiritual life, let me tell you, you don't really know what you're even talking about. And the voices from the margins in particular have been the voices that have elevated spiritual experience at the expense of traditional religion. But so, so mystical experience is, as I want to use it, is a broad category that can lead to a reaffirmation of a religious commitment, a debunking of a religious commitment, or an affirmation that is just religiously kind of beside the point, an affirmation of oneness with nature, with the beauty, the joy, the, all that surrounds us. I mean, what's, what's wrong with that? Um, I do think that as this 
work goes forward, we will see that such uh, an, 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 experience, an experience that can be called mystical in that broader sense is really important as part of the pathway. But what's wrong with stretching out its meaning so as to include others in uh, what that might mean? Why is this all important? Well, I think we are sitting on a, a pivot point in human history. Um, psychedelic Renaissance, I, again, I'm not sure that that's the right terminology, but we are at a pivot point in terms of uh, what's happening around us. It's not simply the university labs and the private companies and the mental health uh, gold rush that's going on here. There is decriminalization occurring as we speak. I mean, I'm, um, uh, I'm coming to you in this lecture from Berkeley, California, came through Oakland, California, which has decriminalized a number of these drugs, uh, which means simply the police are not going to spend their time looking for you. Um, do you know what the latest U.S. city to decriminalize was? Uh, this is important for those of you living in Ontario. Detroit. So will we set up tourism to places like that? Uh, Detroit, Oakland, uh, probably not quite yet. Uh, in fact, there's, a, there's a, a program in Western Canada that has already launched a retreat function uh, using, I believe, it's, uh, I believe it is uh, psilocybin. What I'm suggesting is that decriminalization is, is, is likely, to meet, likely to gather steam in the U.S., it has the support across the political spectrum. Very interesting. Um, th those on the political right, because of their libertarian um, streak, tend to endorse it, as, as well as folks on the left. Um, so it, it's gathering steam in the U.S. Uh, inevitably, I think, we will see increasing decriminalization. We will also see uh, the, our uh, Food and Drug Administration in the U.S., uh, giving approval to certain categories of use of certain drugs for certain purposes. And once they're approved, then, uh, then things begin to happen. Um, th those two pathways are going to lead millions more people into an experience of the use of these drugs. Again, psilocybin, LSD, uh, to some extent, MDMA or DMT or a host of other substances. It's going to lead millions more people worldwide into experimentation with the use of that. And so one of the things that the experts say, depend, I mean, experts across the board in various institutional settings tend to agree that when somebody goes through an intense experience like psychedelic occasioned mystical experience, they need help. They need accompaniment, uh, not recreational. You know, this is not for recreation. This is for serious self-discovery, for uncovering what is deep within, for opening oneself to the possibility to what is beyond and above. Um, but in particular, part of what is needed not just it is not just during the time the drug is active in the system, you know, the six hours or so, uh, but in the days and weeks and indeed months afterward. And they give the name integration to this process. If the experience is not integrated into the you know, larger narrative of your existence, how do you how do you process it? How do you make sense of it? How do you make the most of it? How do you live into its fullest possible meaning? So integration, but the question then becomes, who's going to do the integrating? Who's going to do the integrating uh, work in a, um, in, in a med medical setting? Uh, chaplains, uh, well, there are programs uh, being set up to equip chaplains to prepare to do the work of integration within the medical setting, particularly the mental health wing of the hospital or of the, of, of the um, uh, medical uh, facility. Uh, but my question is who will help us as a society? Individual, integration, make sense of the meaning. How about societal 
integration. Who will help us as a society make sense of this pivot moment in human history in which we are discovering, <laughs> I was gonna say something new, but it's not new. These things have been around for thousands of years. In that sense, they are being rediscovered. In that sense, the word Renaissance is not exactly inappropriate. We are rediscovering what was already known. But who is going to help us as a society interpret what these things mean? Um, let me close with a couple of uh, implications as I see them for organized religion. This is, after all, a religion lecture, and we do want to honor, uh, once again, the memory of Elias Andrews. Uh, and his work in support of um, religion and psychology in particular. Um, I, I've suggested that I don't think that the significance of this research is going to be particularly helpful to organized religion. If anything, I'm sus kind of suspicious about this, partly because I think organized religion tends to be a little bit huh, stuck. Is that fair? stuck in maintaining its institutions, its doctrines, its weddedness to the status quo, to the establishment positions. And oh, some of us in institutional religion have grown beyond where the institutions were in the 50s and 60s. But still, there's a kind of a pushback. I mean, I don't get very far, folks, in talking in religious circles, either theological education or in religion scholarship. I don't get very far talking about this, but I've kind of taken it up as a, uh, as a, a cause that needs to be advanced because to the extent religion neglects this, religion will, I think, continue to suffer one more dimension of loss. I mean, there's a lot going against organized religion right now. I don't need to read down the list. You all know what I'm talking about. Organized religion is um, on the defensive. Um, to, to say to our society, oh, this is bogus. This is your brain on drugs. This is nothing religiously meaningful. This is not spiritual. This is worse, this is satanic. <laughs> That's just, I think, the wrong message to give to so many people in our religious communities who do suffer from profound depression or anxiety or PTSD and will be undergoing these experiments um, and, and uh, therapies. So organized religion, uh, be careful. Um, and watch out, there's something new going on new religious communities. Uh, while being out here in uh, <laughs> this crazy West Coast culture, I have connected a little bit with a church that is uh, based in uh, Oakland and in Berkeley. I have uh, crossed the bay twice to meet with them in person. Most of the time we meet via Zoom. Um, it sees plant medicine including fungus medicine, as the new dimensions of sacraments. It sees spiritual experience um, coming as a result of these uh, uses of these sacraments as, as being at the very center of what it means to be a religious community. Um, it's a very interesting uh, thing that we're seeing. Uh, there's an increasing number. I, I really wish I knew how many local communities across North America and to some extent in Europe, local communities that have an alternate sacramental structure, not the seven sacraments of the Catholic Church, not the two sacraments of the Protestant Church, but a whole array of plant sacraments. Oh, and DMT as well, a whole array. Ayahuasca, psilocybin, DMT. Um, very, very interesting. A blip, I don't think so. And very interesting to watch them kind of come together 
with their consciousness of a community trying to invent rituals and patterns and do so carefully with, with a great deal of responsibility and constraint. Another thing that's happening in terms of implications for religion is uh, retreat settings. Uh, we're gonna see, I think, more and more of this. And some of them will be hybridized with religious traditions. Some of them will be, what's to say, much more secular. People are already flying off to the Netherlands or to Jamaica or to Portugal. Uh, those are the primary, well, to the Amazon, uh, Brazil in particular. Those are the primary places. And so it takes on a kind of a, a superficial aura of what um, psychedelic tourism. Uh, but I think the people on the other end take the work seriously and they wanna offer a intensive two, three, four day experience how meaningful is that? Well, more meaningful than no experience, I suppose. But um, we're going to see, I think, more and more and more of that uh, begin to uh, become part of the landscape. And more of, uh, as part of the landscape, more of a feeder system by which ordinary people culminating, um, accumulating in, in, in terms of numbers like millions, in which ordinary people encounter these drugs and the experiences that they occasion. But I'm gonna come back in closing to this question of a broad cultural awakening. Um, pipe dream of the 1960s certainly was, it didn't pan out very well. Um, the empire struck back, the, um, the counter counterculture won in the end. Uh, Nixon was reelected. Um, you, you know the story. Um, is it a pipe dream of the 60s? Is it just one more hallucination that we living, we're living in a moment in which there will be such numbers of participants in uh, this kind of mystical experience, which again, I want to broaden to include experiences that debunk and experiences that may have almost nothing explicit to do with religion, all right? Are we living in a moment, a pivotal moment in which those experiences become more and more common, more and more widespread, so that they have not just an individual impact, but a cultural impact? Might it be that we are living through a time in which an ecological consciousness and the need for a compassionate mode of existence with each other and with the natural world. Less materialistic consumption, less carbon, more community, less angry, more accepting of ourselves and others, more spiritually alive. Here in the US, we like the word woke. Are you woke? to the injustices that plague a racist and classist society. Are you aware of all of that? I wanna ask, are we not simply woke, but are we awake, more spiritually alive, more awake, more aware, and more in awe of the incredible beauty that surrounds us? Pipe dream of the 60s? Let me know what you think. Thank you very much, Dr. Cole Turner, for a thought-provoking uh, reflection and lecture. And you've given us much, much to, to tussle with here. Um, the questions that you have asked to us about asked us about society about the role of faith communities within society about the world about social justice and connecting all of that with spiritual emotions and mystical experiences you, you have really opened up a um, an enormous uh topic area for us that is of great importance and as you were talking, I was able to take a look uh, in our um, participant list uh, and see the people, some of the people who were there. And I see that we've got a really wonderful, diverse uh, audience and should be able to uh, entertain some um, important uh, questions from different perspectives 
here. We have uh, people here from uh, the Psychedelics Research Collaborative at Queen's. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Queen's does now have a Psychedelics Research Collaborative. There's also one at, uh, or a parallel one at U of T. Uh, David Clements is the Executive Director and is with us. Uh, thank you for attending, David. Uh, we have many uh, people here from the Canadian Council of Churches. We have people here from Health Sciences, Neuroscience, uh, religious studies and theology from across uh, North America. So um, without further ado, I'd like to open this up to a Q&A session. I would ask that you uh, use the um, raise your hand function at the bottom of your screen. If you have a question or a comment for Ron, um, a viewpoint, uh, please raise your hand and I'll attempt to get to as many of you as I can. Um, we have technically until 7 p.m. Uh, Eastern time, but uh, Ron has uh, kindly said that he would be willing to stay a bit longer if um, we end up having more discussion that continues on. Uh, so are there any questions? And again, if there are or just comments, uh, please raise your hand. And that will be under reactions for a hand raise. Aditi. Hi, sorry, I just sort of got my, uh, hi, I'll just say. Okay, so I was wondering what uh, your opinion is on the Rig Vedic culture that is, especially in ancient Hinduism, you have the whole culture of Soma and of course the whole psychedelic experience that is recorded in the whole soma ritual and i'm wondering uh, what your opinion is on that sort of uh, ritual and that sort of understanding as gordon watson has said it's uh, probably mushrooms probably psychedelic mushrooms that they were talking about even though we don't know what soma ritual is i'm wondering what your take is on that ancient indian uh, take on uh on the sort of psychedelic drugs yes i will thank you aditi uh sadly <clears throat> i have to admit to knowing almost nothing uh, uh directly about this um but I, I have two thoughts one is there is a um uh not simply the um quest for uh, kind of an archaeological cultural quest for uh, what was going on back then applied to uh, the, uh, to India, but also to the eastern part of the Mediterranean, the Hellenistic world. And uh, the, so these two uh, quests are going on and who knows where, where they will lead. Uh, bits of archaeological evidence uh, uh, correlated with bits of, um, of literary uh, evidence um, and uh, it's just going to be fascinating to see. The second observation, though, is I, I was happening to attend a, um, a perfectly, uh, what, an, uh, a nice, enlightened uh, Christian service the other day, and we sang uh, a hymn, which is um, uh, in most Christian hymnals, uh, the words have been updated a little bit. The opening line is, Dear Lord and Father of Mankind. I forget how it's reworded, but it, we've gotten rid of that uh, exclusive language. But perhaps uh, the Christians in, uh, on the call will recognize that. The text is by John Greenleaf Whittier. Uh, so over 100 years ago, he's writing about, um, about Christian... Um, quietness, uh, drop thy still dews of quietness is one of the lines there. Well, the poem uh, goes on and on. We only sing the last five stanzas, but the poem goes on and on, and it starts with just a, um, a, a what, a, almost a, a um, uh, irreverent ridicule of Soma. Uh, it's almost like the poet is saying, well, I thank God that we Christians are not like other people who have this, this, this primitive kind of ritual. Uh, and thank God that, uh, th thank you, God, for, he, as he puts it, reclothing us in our rightful mind. Well, gosh, uh, I, I mean, I, Whittier's a great poet, 
or a pretty good poet, I should say. But that's kind of the attitude of, of um, even enlightened Christianity. Um, it, uh, we have nothing to learn from the past. We have nothing to learn from the East. We have nothing to learn from the use of these uh, substances in antiquity. And uh, thank goodness we have everything we need right here in our, in our Bible and in our prayer book. And uh, um, so I, I appreciate your mentioning this. I wish I, I could add more and, and perhaps there are others on the call who, who are experts in that, but I know that there is research going on on that field right now. Thank you. And thank you, Edidi, for that good question. Uh, I see Jacob has his hand raised. Thank you so much. Hi, Ron. It's wonderful to see you speaking. It's wonderful to hear about what you've been working on in more detail. And I wonder um, if you could comment on the resources that folks are drawing on when they're trying to develop these new rituals around the experiences that they're having and the experiences they're trying to facilitate. Because I'm curious to know if you've noticed any trends or common wells that they're going back to, like, you know, the doors of perception, or uh, if we want to go outside of texts, like, dark side of the moon or any kind of you know popular music that they're learnt, that they're turning to or symbolism and you know in my own work I've noticed a certain preference for yoga um, among folks who are trying to develop their own systems and their own catalog of symbols yeah. thank you well, thank you, Jacob, and I am so glad that you're on this call. Um, for those of you who don't know Jacob Boss, I, he's one of the most brilliant young, uh, what, anthropologists of religion and, and uh, human enhancement and uh, body hacking, and I, I don't know what all you're in, into there, uh, Jacob, but um, I, I keep encouraging him to get that publication out because everybody's going to want to read it. Um, but um, but I, I, you, you don't know the number of times I thought of you specifically, Jacob, when I would try to make sense of what I was encountering with this church in, um, in Berkeley. Um, I, I am simply not trained as you are, as, as, a, as an observer. And I, I guess I wasn't approaching it that way anyway, at least in any professional sense. But you're asking a really good question. And uh, when you run out of things to do, here is a whole new network of growing, uh, of emerging rel new religious communities that desperately need the patient, immersive, disciplined eye of an anthropologist to ask just the sort of questions you're asking. Uh, I, I tried to meet with the leader of that uh, of the uh, uh, Berkeley group, and that, that just never worked out. I think it, it's so much, it's, it's one of the casualties of the pandemic. Uh, so I, I didn't get a chance to kind of interview any, anybody in any detail. But um, uh, gosh, the, I, I'm convinced that the, the, the numbers will grow and that the... Um, what people are discovering in locales, in isolated locales, using separate uh, um, menu of sacraments, uh, will uh, th th they're going to discover some of the same things, make some of the same mistakes. Um, I mean, they they talk uh, they, 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 about two weeks ago. I was on a call, a Zoom Zoom meeting, with about well about a hundred people, but about six leaders of these emerging communities uh, from Portland basically to Los Angeles. And uh, they were pretty candid about uh, some of the things that haven't gone well. And um, yeah, they, they're, they're, they're real struggles that they're going to face. <laughs> it's almost as if they are um, set up to, to, to repeat all the mistakes of historical Christianity. Um, including our latest mistakes, but um, but, but, but but we'll see. Uh, the 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 slate of sacraments is no panacea. Uh, community is messy business, and finding what works in terms of a anthropological core that that brings a community together 
Um, is, is, is this going to be a work in progress? And again, I, I so often wished you were with me as we were uh, uh, encountering the community in Berkeley. Thank you, Jacob. Tibet. Tibet, maybe you've stepped away from your mic. Yeah. Um, I want to ask something about bat trips because the aspects you laid out um, are like connecting with God almost. And bat trips, I've heard at least, I've never had one, but it's like so fearful and so intense. It's like the opposite. And, um, you know, the good aspects can develop openness in someone, but could the bad aspects can be, can they be so intense that um, even if you were open previously, the experience you had uh, restricted you so much in your conceptual um, courage and inquisitiveness that you're like more, um, much less open than previous, for example. Is this like a bipolar situation uh, or not? Yeah, bi binary, yeah. Um, I'm not sure that it is. Uh, you, you're, you're absolutely right about the reality of the so-called bad trip. Um, and there, you know, there are numerous theories as to how to explain that. Is it a, is it a, a bubbling up of awareness of pain and trauma and repressed um, uh, passions uh, from the past? Um, probably that's on the right track. Uh, it, it does put one in touch with stuff that is deeper down and covered over. Um, my impression listening to some of the people engaged in the research, though, is that in the properly prepared clinical setting with expert guides, two, two expert guides in the room during the entire session, um, yeah, there might be some difficult material that surfaces for the research subject, but by and large, um, even the difficult is revelatory in a sense that in retrospect, it is seen as positive. I mean, to be aware of um, the, what, the, the, uh, the puzzling, the enigmatic, the repressed, the... Uh, the, the, the kind of the, the, the head of the serpent as it manifests itself in a kind of a hallucinogenic moment. Um, to be aware of that is um, better than not to be aware of it. Well, I think that's probably where a lot of folks come out. So even, an, even, a, even a difficult trip is in the end, not necessarily a bad trip, bad in the sense of nothing but negative. It may be intensely difficult, but so I, I'm not sure that it's a clean binary between, oh, you're gonna have a good trip or you're gonna have a bad trip, right? It's, um, I don't think it, it, it works like that uh, from everything that I can gather. Now we have different substances and I think different substances can uh, probably uh, uh, occasion different pathways. Um, but um, uh, 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 very good question. And, and uh, harm reduction, I, I, I didn't say anything about that, but harm reduction is a major motif uh, in the psychedelic renaissance. Uh, the religious, new religious communities, they are talking very much about harm reduction. And partly it's this so-called, you know, difficult or bad trip. Uh, clearly the um, uh, university researchers. And if you think anybody really, really has a stake in this, uh, obviously the drug companies, uh, they wanna clean out all the clutter uh, and, and make this as smooth a sailing pathway toward therapy as they possibly can. Um, so uh, harm reduction is a, a universally recognized uh, dimension of trying to advance our understanding of the effects of these drugs. Thank you for that. And thank you, Tibet. Tibet is a philosophy student at Queens. Um, Carrie. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. OK, 
Great, great. Thank you uh, so much for the really excellent uh, talk, Dr. Cole Turner. Um, if I can, can I make a quick comment about the bad trips first, and then and then bring up my uh, um, sure. my question for you? Yeah, sure. please do. Um, so maybe I'll maybe I'll kind of couple them together. Um, but uh, you know, I'm coming from um, the path of sort of you know I really appreciated how you brought the you know religion meeting this psychedelic renaissance. But I'm coming from the path of, I sort of felt like a spiritual orphan at 13, grew up in the Anglican church and declared myself sort of rebelliously an atheist. And uh, then over, you know, the coming decades, um, it was psychedelic experiences that reawoke me to a, a spiritual understanding through mystical experiences of being alive in the world. And um, so I was really compelled by uh, your idea, not only of this personal integration need that we're going to have, but also this broader social integration. Um, so that, that I guess, sorry, I did say it in reverse order. That's my sort of question for you is to expand on this idea of how you see social integration in broader ways. Um, but I just wanna make a comment to Tibet about bad trips in, in my lifelong experience through the psychedelic world. Um, you know, sort of like you mentioned, Dr. Cole Turner, bad trips, you know, it's it's definitely not a sort of, uh, in my experience, a bipolar kind of one or the other. It's sort of, you know, Stan Groff and his transpersonal psychology looks at going into sort of these shadow places, these, these places of depth, and they can be scary and frightening, and there can actually be like visual monsters at times. But um, the uh, my experience has been that there is greater self-knowing, greater uh, integration of the dark and scary places that can exist within ourselves and in the collective. Um, so that I'm not, that's not to say that a bad trip is um, always a good thing for each person, but that in my experience, it can um, create a greater picture of the, the of wholeness of, of our human experience. Um, yeah, so, but I would love to hear you expand on the idea of social integration in a broader sense. I find that really compelling. Yeah, well, I appreciate that. And, and thank you so much for what you just said um, about your personal experience. I mean, you said it brilliantly and beautifully. Uh, I really appreciate it. Um, you know, I wish I had more to say about what I'm calling social integration. Again, by that I mean, how will we as a culture, as a society, um, accommodate and integrate into our collective cultural awareness um, the insight that is being gained here uh, by um, uh, th those who undergo this kind of um, um, drug occasioned myst mystical experience. Uh, my guess is, Carrie, that you had somebody to work with you and to help you. Um, and my guess is it probably was not somebody wearing a, a, a priestly collar, uh, but probably somebody working in a, a different kind of setting or maybe just a very uh, compassionate and knowledgeable friend. We need a lot of compassionate and knowledgeable friends to befriend one another as we go through this kind of an experience, not to hive off into some sort of counterculture, 60s style, God help us, but somehow stay, uh, I mean, this is, this is to me one of the exciting things about having uh, academic institutions like Johns Hopkins University, one of our top U.S. medical schools, or having uh, uh, programs across Canada, including your one now at Queens, having having this conversation legitimated by um, mainstream, solid, respectable institutional players. And uh, as much as I am slightly worried about the millions of dollars flowing this way and that way, I'd rather see uh, that kind of mainstreaming, even with the money 
and the risks that, that entails, then see it hive off again into kind of a um, uh, flower culture uh, sort of um, movement that spawns the counter reaction. We don't need a counter reaction with this. We need a growing center of, 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 of people a sensible, moderate perspective that, that says, look, folks, there is more to human awareness than we've let on. There are deeper dimensions of human possibility than we have understood. We can open our minds to um, ever to more, to richer, to, again, to, to, to compassion, to equal. I mean, so many things are crying out at one time. And it, it seems to me that if we can connect them, the ecological, uh, the healing of relationships among peoples. Uh, I know you, you uh, folks in Canada are, are just um, uh, uh, doing very, very serious work in struggling with the meaning of, of being um, newcomers in a land occupied for tens of thousands of years. You're ahead of us in the US. But, but that's just one more agenda in which compassion and breadth and let's look at this another way and what are we missing here and uh, personality trait of openness writ large on the culture. Oh, that's, that's in short supply here in the US. Uh, but I, I, I hope this is not a, a warmed over a pipe dream from the 60s that's speaking to you right now. I, I hope that as a result of conversations like the one we are having at this moment, uh, we will trigger that kind of a critical mass of serious minded people who will recognize this as a moment of great opportunity moving forward and understanding um, uh, what the, the, the the profoundly human possibilities for a flourishing, inclusive, gentle, ecologically balanced human culture. Tall order, but I'm hopeful. Thank you, Ron, and thank you, Carrie. Uh, we have a couple more questions that we're going to get to shortly. Uh, because we have officially uh, had our end time set for seven o'clock, I just want to um, take a, a little pause here and thank uh, Ron Cole Turner formally on behalf of Queen's School of Religion and the Elias Andrews uh, Lectureship for speaking with us tonight and for introducing such an important topic, um, taking the risk of putting it out there because as you said, this is a difficult topic for many people who come from faith communities to grapple with and it should be a difficult topic. It's complex, it has a lot of implications and we're just starting to um, unpack some of those now. So thank you to anyone who has to leave us now. I really appreciate you, you joining us. And Adnan. Well, firstly, let me add my thanks um, for a wonderful lecture on a fascinating and important topic. Um, I guess I have kind of two parts connected to one another. Um, in this question you mentioned in your uh, discussion about this being, uh, you know, the discovery of the health and, um, you know, particularly mystical uh, dimensions of these uh, psychedelic drugs as a challenge to um, established conventional or traditional organized religion. I was wondering also if from the other side, you could say that perhaps for those who have been engaged and interested in mysticism, that this val validates mysticism and lends in some ways greater support for the idea that over time, over periods of history, whether or not psychedelic or psychoactive drugs were involved, that, uh, you know, people have had, um, you know, other kinds of otherworldly sorts of experiences that have been, you know, very important in their ethical and spiritual uh, lives. And I guess the second kind of point kind of connected is that I wonder if there is some tension um, between seeking mystical experience and inducing it through these mechanisms and the idea or ideal of receiving these sorts of experiences through one's kind of preparation for it. I'm just sort of thinking of a 12th century Sufi uh, manual that kind of tried to discourage people from overvaluing the visionary and ecstatic experiences one might have along the way 
and seeking them out for their own sake, as opposed to doing the preparation and being open to this experience coming to them by some kind of divine bestowal. Of course, we're talking about a very deistic kind of model in Islam or in Christianity, but there was a tension about you shouldn't really induce these things and seek them, but you should receive them when you're ready, they will come to you. I just wondered if your, your thoughts on that in the contemporary phenomena, is there a tension in the, in the modern experience that's at all being worked out? Oh, thank you so much, Adnan. I, I appreciate that. And we're, we're looking at your uh, screen here and we see the um, um, uh, image that evokes for us the mystical tradition within Islam. Now, I wish I had something um, really insightful to say about the um, way in which this so-called psychedelic renaissance might be playing in um, those minority circles, and, and let's just stay within Christianity because it's the only place I know here really, um, those minority circles within Christianity that, that value mysticism. Um, who are the mystics that are being read today? What are the mystic communities? Um, and th 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 that would be a fascinating um, course of study. Uh, my impression talking to people is that there's just not much interest or awareness. Maybe with more awareness, there would be some interest um, in the um, role of these drugs in inducing uh, or occasioning these experiences. Yes, I think it does validate um, the reports of the mystics over the ages uh, a number of whom, uh, again, in the Christian tradition, uh, sometimes sickness would be a pathway. Sometimes climbing to a mountaintop would be a pathway. Sometimes fasting would be the pathway. In other words, stuff that messes with the brain. Well, okay, suppose you can get to that interaction with the brain in a much more um, straightforward way, using uh, something like psilocybin, and, and, and you know, forget, forget the mountain, forget the um, forget the fasting, um, or maybe not forget it. Maybe pursue multiple paths simultaneously. I don't know of any mystic who uh, wouldn't say at some time or other they felt stuck. Uh, or felt as if the, 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 the effort was coming up impoverished and barren. How, how we'll find our way forward on this is, is really anybody's guess. Now, you, you, you mentioned an interesting dichotomy between uh, those who discipline themselves to pursue mystical experience through, through um, a cultivation of the practices of uh, meditation, of uh, prayer, um, of let's say fasting. Uh, there are similar kinds of approaches in, uh, around the globe, various traditions. Uh, you, you and I know the Western traditions obviously better than the Eastern ones, um, but, uh, but clearly in the Western traditions, there are people who devote themselves uh, in, in, um, in, in Christianity, typically it's a pathway of self-denial, of asceticism, of uh, renouncing of all kinds of uh, human fleshly desires, of unquestioned obedience to the pathway of discipline and practice and uh, the will of God. And only then does, a, does the deepened insight come. That's kind of the monastic tradition of the West. Well, you know, along comes Protestantism. <laughs> you know, we've been around 500 years, but along comes Protestantism and kind of shakes that up a little bit. Um, maybe in a way that re-invokes some of the biblical traditions themselves, but along comes Protestantism and says, you know, enough of this monkishness. I mean, Luther said nasty things about the monks, even though he was one himself. Uh, he said some pretty nasty things about them. And likewise, Calvin, uh, John Calvin, the head of the Reformed tradition, very nasty things. And of course, Henry VIII went around, um, what, 
uh, selling or, buy, or, or appropriating the monasteries. Uh, Protestants have not been very uh, much in favor of the monastic pathway of self-discipline by which one cultivates a readiness to receive a mystical experience. Uh, if anything, we've been a little skeptical of that, and the Catholics have pushed back, and it's created an interesting conversation. Well, along comes William James, very much fashioned within the community of New England Protestantism. Uh, it's become liberal Christianity at that point, but it's still, it's still characteristically Protestant. And the thing about Protestantism is mysticism, religious experience, comes by grace. It doesn't come by preparation. It comes by grace. It breaks out of the blue. It overtakes you. It converts you. And you're not seeking it. Uh, it, it seeks you. It captures you. And, um, well, of course, there are, there are Protestants who speak in a different tone on that. But that's kind of the common core of Protestantism, is uh, to emphasize the sheer unexpected, unprepared graciousness of the, of the uh, uh, mystical encounter, uh, as strong or as weak as that might be, which leads one to a conversion and to uh, a participation in, in this particular form of Christianity. So we've had this debate, and James, James kind of tilts toward the unprovoked, unexpected, short-term, intense uh, mystical experience. And as a result of that, that's shaped the literature uh, from William James right through William Stace to today's laboratory. I mean, the questions that I read uh, midway through the lecture uh, uh, grow out of James and his, his, um, his being reinterpreted by William James. So there's, a, there's this sort of, it, it's, it's not just Western, it's not just Christian, it's Protestant uh, in its core inspiration for the kind of a suddenness, unexpectedness, and lack of pre preparation uh, that um, correlates, very interesting, with psychedelics. You don't have to be a monk to receive a mystical experience. You simply need 20 to 30 milligrams of psilocybin. Uh, really, is it that simple? And if it is, does that mean that the pill is a new form of grace? I mean, we're, we're, we're talking about some very complex theological issues here. Um, if, it, if it is by grace that we receive a mystical experience and some of us have the experience occasioned by psilocybin or other drugs, what can we conclude from that except that, oh, dare I say, <laughs> right? I mean, this is it's a good thing I'm retiring from a theological school. Uh, dare I say that the, the drug is a form of grace? Well, a lot of people are going to push back at that, and I think we need to wrestle with that idea uh, at great length. But you see where all this is kind of coming from in terms of its uh, 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 re recent history over the last uh, 500 years and 100 years, et cetera. But thank you for the question, Adam. Yes, thank you, Ed. and that, that was a really uh, powerful question and, and so important, uh, the question of, of cheating. Are we cheating if people use psychedelics to have a mystical experience? Or indeed, as you're saying, Ron, is that um, yet one more occasion for the grace of uh, the divine? Uh, big question, indeed. Caitlin has a question. Caitlin uh, was a, a master's student here at Queens, the School of Religion, and I had the pleasure of supervising her thesis. So Caitlin, over to you. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, um, thank you for your time tonight, Dr. Roll uh, Turner. It's, uh, it's an honor to hear you speak. Um, I've been a fan of your work through for many years. Um, so in my work, I deal with human enhancement technologies, specifically um, brain, uh, whole brain emulation. And in doing so, I come across many points at which um, Christians and Christian leaders and Christian thought push back in, um, and as to reject such technology, reject embracing such technology. And so you made a point about how, um, you know, modern Christian religious leaders push back against the use of psychedelics. So I was wondering if you could go into that more. I apologize, Vu, you sort of touched on it in the last uh, question, but yeah, just more in depth. Is it, a, is it a refusal to grow? Is it, you know, are there biblical reasons? Is it a, a willful ignorance? I'm curious about that. Thank you. 
Hey, Caitlin, can you stay unmuted there for just a second? Can, can you say uh, again, uh, whole brain? Emulation. Emulation, okay. Yeah. So um, uh, as a pathway toward the living beyond the body, right? Correct, yeah. Okay, all right. I just want to make sure I've got that. Yeah, well, well that particular technological niche raises some very interesting questions. And I have to admit, I'm, I'm a little bit skeptical about where that's going to lead. But uh, the deeper theological issue is whether um, it, it's a kind of high-tech resurrection. Um, and it, and it, it just uncovers some uncertainties and discomforts on the part of Christian theologians about what on earth is meant by resurrection. Uh, and there's a lot of theological effort being put in into this today to try to sort out what is meant theologically. But if you could take the uh, a reasonable approximation of the sum total of a, of a human person's experiences, memories, and awareness, um, and transfer it to another physical, physical substrate, silicon or whatever, another physical substrate, and it's active in a way that has an ongoing consciousness, is that a kind of technical um, substitute for a resurrection? Um, well, again, I, I, think the ang I, I think the pushback is almost, almost best explained by um, Christian theological anxiety by, about what do we mean by resurrection? Is the resurrection a kind of re, um, uh, uh, not, not reincarnation, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, a resuscitation, that's the word. Um, interestingly, in Spanish, the word is the same. Uh, the root is the same. In English, we distinguish between resurrection in the biblical sense and resuscitation in the medical sense. But is our view of resurrection really a kind of a divinely zapped uh, resuscitation um, so that everything just simply comes back and, the, you know, the heart starts ticking again? And um, I mean, if, that, if that's it, I, I'm not much interested um, but I think that's it for a lot of Christians. Theologians are just much more, what, uh, agnostic about what the substance of the claim of resurrection is. Although, you know, pa Paul in, in the biblical text is pretty, pretty explicit. If you don't have the resurrection, you don't have much. Uh, so uh, Christian theologians sense that they are, they can't simply dismiss this as kind of a three-level universe, uh, and yet they can't make sense of it, given their anthropology. And so, it, but at any rate, I think that's, that's, a, that's a peculiarity that attaches to this particular category. Uh, but but, but you're, you, you framed the question, I think, in a way that uh, leads us to think about other forms of technology that are um, maybe not quite as audacious as this, but are, uh, lead to other possibilities of transformation that are really pretty profound. Uh, for uh, the whole, the whole uh, gamut of, of, of spirit, uh, I'm sorry, of, 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 uh, of um, human enhancement. Um, and I don't know, a number of years ago, I set myself on the pathway to begin to try to make sense of the, of the range of technologies of human enhancement. That, by the way, is how I came across the idea of spiritual enhancement and learned about this Johns Hopkins experiment, et cetera, uh, but at the broader frame of human enhancement. And on the one hand, um, you, you look at that and you think, um, is there a limit beyond which human enhancement technologies will not take us? Uh, the transhumanists certainly think there is no preset limit. Uh, we will modify, modify, modify until we become something quite different. Uh, if that's the case, what are we to make of that theologically? Are we to say, oh, that's just really, really a bad idea? Um, not because it'll go badly, but because it might go well. But it's just, it, it's not what human beings are here for. We're here to kind of live in our box. Uh, 
our created status, our, fi our finite, the finitude is good. I read in a lot of my um, theological colleagues um, over against another tradition within Christianity that says we're, we are created to uh, grow, to be transformed, to, uh, well, the East, Eastern Christian, the Orthodox, uh, have this category of theosis or divinization, to use the Latin equivalent, theosis, becoming divine. Are we here to become so transformed that we become, oh, one has to be very careful with words here, but in some respects, godlike. And the transhumanists look at that and say, yeah, sign me up. Uh, Christians in a very different way, I think, have to take that seriously. But it, it goes back to the, the comment I was making a moment ago in respect to uh, Adnan's question or, or comment. Um, to what extent, if something happens, to what extent is it the will and the purpose of the creator in the first place? Did God create humanity for its own self-transformation or did God create humanity to keep us in our box? I, and I, I don't like the second approach. I think if, um, if, if there's a theological dimension to this discussion of the limits of technology, it would be to say something like this, um, that creation is not done, that transformation is what lies ahead, that there are various ways, cultural, intellectual, but also technological, in which human beings may enhance or transform or transcend themselves and attain to a higher level of awareness, of capability, of intelligence, of um, subtlety in thought and in existence. Um, and if that happens, who are we to say that that is, that defies the creator? I don't believe it does. I believe it is a living out of the uh, gift of of the creation at the beginning. I mean, the, the, you know, the, the creation evolves, the cosmos evolves, the earth comes from cosmogenesis, life begins on earth, life becomes more and more complicated. Are we done yet? No. Will technology play a role in whatever lies ahead? I believe it will. And I believe that that is what theologically warranted. So I, I have a, I have a lot of frustration. I think you, you share this, uh, Caitlin. I have a lot of frustration with so many Christians who, who uh, when this topic is technology, say no. When the topic is enhancement, say, oh, we're playing God. Um, when the topic is uh, any of these things, they seem to think that finitude is, you know, just accept your creatureliness and be quiet and that's it. I, I, I don't find that convincing. I, I see, I, I don't claim to know much about God, but I don't imagine that God is done with things yet. And I do imagine that there are transformations that lie ahead, um, inspired by human imagination and fueled by human technology. Um, the, the, and, uh, and who knows where it might lead. Thank you. And thank you, Caitlin. Uh, that's a perfect place to end this, I think, uh, Ron, on the topic of imagination, technology, an ongoing um, unfolding creation, and all the passionate debates that the convergence of those things are sure to continue to uh, provoke. And uh, without passion, where would we, would we be? So um, thank you very much once again, for giving us so much to think about. Uh, it's been truly an honor to have you speak with us tonight. Well, thank you so much. Thank you everyone who's participated for the questions and just for your attention. I appreciate it very much. Good night, everyone.